Welcome to the Corporate Treasury 101 podcast. In today's episode, we discuss credit rating process, ESG in ratings, and the current climate in the rating industry with Alex Griffith from Fitch Ratings. Alex is a managing director and head of the EMEA corporate ratings at Fitch Ratings. Fitch Ratings is a credit agency that rates the viability of investments relative to the likelihood of default. Fitch is one of the top three credit rating agencies internationally known, along with Moody's and Standard & Poor's. In the episode of today, expect to learn what is credit rating, what criteria do rating agencies consider when assigning a credit rating to a company or a country, how does the role of a corporate treasury department factor into this process, how do factors such as interest rates and inflation impact credit ratings, what are some of the challenges in incorporating ESG factors into credit ratings? And like always, much, much more. This is honestly one of the most interesting episodes we got to record so far. Alex is passionate about his topic and extremely fast on answering even our most intricate questions. We truly hope you will enjoy the episode. If that is the case, and when you are thinking about how you found our podcast, chances are that it was through word of mouth, social media, or a recommendation from your favorite podcast platform. And this is our only request to you. The only way we can get more and more amazing guests like Alex and get more people to learn about treasury is thanks to you. So if you enjoy what you hear and maybe learn a thing or two, please consider following the show, leaving a review, or sharing this episode to help others discover it too. With all that being said, please welcome Alex Griffith. Alex, thanks so much for joining. Great to have you on. Can you get us started by telling us what a credit rating actually is? Absolutely. It's important to um, to understand the definitions because it is a little bit technical. Um, and knowing what you're dealing with is the first part of understanding how credit ratings move, how they can be used, all that sort of stuff. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll read a definition here because it's important to get this right. So credit ratings are assigned to issuers or obligations that are an opinion on the ability of entity or instrument to meet financial commitments, such as interest or principal on bonds, debt preferred dividends, insurance claims, or counterparty obligations in accordance with the terms of the investment. I mean, one, they're an opinion. Uh, there's no absolute right or wrong here. We're effectively trying to forecast the future. Secondly, it's about the, the ability of an entity or instrument to meet financial commitments. So you know, I look at corporates. It's all about can the corporate repay its debt, essentially. Yeah, we'd normally focus on uh, on bonds and loans as those financial commitments. But sometimes when we're thinking about an entity, our considerations can go further to things like leases, which can sometimes, if they're not honoured, lead to a, a, a default being recognised. And then there's the final point, which is uh, in accordance with the terms of the investment. So yeah, we're trying to to understand here, is a company doing what it said it would do in the first instance? You get situations where sometimes payments can be deferred. If that's in line with the original terms of the document, uh, that's unlikely to trigger a default. But if it's something where you know, it even looks fairly plain vanilla, um, it, it, everybody agrees to it, but it's not in accordance with the terms of the investment, that can start to look like it might trigger um, some, some kind of default action on our basis. So how are those used? Why are those important? How are they used in the market? And, and what do people, and specifically treasurers perhaps, What's the importance of treasurer for ratings? So, I mean, essentially, one of the things you're doing as a treasurer, and uh, I'm not a treasurer, but I, I understand the job a bit. One of the things you're trying to do is diversify funding sources, make sure that you've got access to funding from lots of different pools of capital. Now, there are some pools of capital out there, and they're pretty large pools of capital out there that will only be able to invest in a bond if it's got a credit, late, credit rating. So, you know, typically what we see are uh, if we have, say, a, a company that's been fairly well banked in its local market, maybe there's a local bond market that doesn't require credit ratings. It's got maybe a local bond, but they're trying to build a really big plant. They need a lot more money, and there they have to seek foreign investors. And usually those investors will want a credit rating. Yeah, you know, They need it for inclusion in indices, for example, 
where uh, a lot of money is invested in fixed income indices. And some of that eligibility criteria revolves around having a credit rating. Also, a lot of uh, in, in institutional investors in certain funds can't invest in things that aren't rated. The market well-being, Alex, is highly based on trust, right? Yeah. Would you say that the credit ratings help building that trust between the different stakeholders? Because if we were to look at all the like different entities you have out there, financial institutions and so on, even as a, an outstanding corporate, it might be a bit tricky sometimes to know who does what. So would credit ratings help on that aspect? Uh, absolutely. I mean, that's why, that's why they exist. So if you're a third-party investor thinking about investing in a bond, you don't have anybody's unbiased in the mix unless the credit rating agencies are involved. So you have the bank who is trying to essentially offload the debt into the market, working for their client. You've got the, uh, the issuer that obviously wants you to participate in the, in the transaction. Uh, what credit ratings offer is a third-party unbiased opinion on that. So that's why the markets value them, uh, you know, why they're, they're often required by different parties. I mean, the, the other thing they can do sometimes is deal with, with an asymmetry of information. So yeah, unlike, certainly unlike third-party investors, we often get parties or our parties that confidential information that isn't shared with the market. So we might see more detailed forecasts, for example, that is included in our, in our credit rating. We keep the information confidential, but reflect that in, in the rating. So um, often it's also a way of issuers to share a bit more and, and get the credit for, for a bit more where the party they know is firmly committed to confidentiality. The third, you know, the third parties investing in it get the benefit of that, but the information is kept is kept within a within a, a sealed wall. So overall, I mean, the, the purpose of these ratings is to have a third party, which is unbiased in the transaction, to give, uh, let's say, objective opinion on the risk level towards investing in certain companies, or for borrowers to lend. Uh, it's it's about it's it's all about credit risk. So it's it's I mean it's very simplest. It's how likely am I to get my money back? We don't express these things in default probabilities. Yeah, you know, I think I think a lot of people would find it easier if we did. But you know what we're very aware of is the financial conditions can vary an awful lot, and that can vary overall default probabilities. So you know the way that I think about it in very simple terms is if you imagine a ship on the sea. And the ship is the thing that we're rating. Yeah, we're telling you how strong the ship is compared to other ships. We're not trying to forecast what the sea is going to do. So what we get is this relative ranking where we say that a, you know, a double A bond rating should be, um, uh, if, we, if we look at it on the aggregate, we should see a, a marked difference between the default rate historically for a double A bond rating versus say a triple B or a single B. And when we look at our uh, look at our default statistics, that's where we get to. Is there an overlap with the insurance industry in some way? Like uh, well, I mean insurers are a big um, a big buyers of bonds. But uh, and there are you know there are various things like credit default swaps and um so there are there are some I suppose there are some links, but it's Probably not directly, I'd have said. Uh, it's not, it's not well, we're, not, we're doing credit ratings. We tend to just think about, we're focused essentially on the company and, and what it's doing. Less so, in fact, on, on the buyers usually. I bring it up because you, you made the ship analogy and, and that was kind of the origin of the insurance industry wasn't from the shipping. And it was, again, assessing. Can you stop using that analogy? <laughs> no, no, because I mean, it's all about assessing risk, right? At the end of the day, which yeah. I guess insurers are there to profit off of their assessment and their understanding of risk in the market and whatever they're insuring, likelihood of getting the money back or not, uh, yep. or having to do a payout, sorry, or not, and then assigning your fee accordingly. But I guess you're not trying to buy into that risk. You're just publishing it, I guess, yep. in a way. Yep. And you have the trust of approval from the market to, okay, if, for example, Fitch gave a certain credit rating, then that, that means something to the market, enables trust. That's the important thing if you're in this market is building up a reputation over time of being unbiased, doing the right thing. Uh, we're only of value if uh, the investors that look at bonds genuinely believe that we are independent. If they think that we are not, then we're of no value. So we've built up our reputation over over decades by 
demonstrably taking an independent independent view. What's the actual process of creating that credit rating? I guess each rating agency has a slightly different. You have your own way. How do you guys do it at Fitch? Yes, they're, they're all they're all slightly different. I wouldn't want to speak for my competitors. Uh, they're sort of different, but you know, and I, I can talk corporate credit. There's only so many variables in corporate credit. So, so this will give you a very, very simple, uh, a very, very simple overview. So, what we the way the way we look at it is is there's really two aspects that are that we focus on. I mean, the first is the qualitative side of things, which is all about understanding the business, and then there's the quantitative side of things, which is once you understand that business, working out some metrics you can use to judge it to 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 try and align it a bit more to a uh, to a rating category. So. The way that we we focus at Fitch, and we, you know, I think we tend to do this a, a bit more zealously than some of our um, some of our competitors potentially, is we try and really understand that business and use that to forecast results going forward. So when I say we try and understand the business, we we do that via over fifty what we call navigators. So for each each sector you're in, we have a, a, a sort of a visual aid or a criteria that we set out which talks about what sort of characteristics are associated with you know, a double A in this sector, a single A in this sector, a triple B in this sector. Uh, and those will, will have qualitative and quantitative aspects associated with them. So you know, a simple example of a qualitative aspect is scale. Scale is, is on pretty much every navigator. And scale is important because you have not just you know, potentially a classic economic economies of scale, what it typically means is you're more diverse. So if you're if you're diversified across different countries, if there's a problem in one country, the rest of them may well be doing okay. You'll usually be diversified across different business lines as well. And what that means is if one business line is not doing very well, the rest are unlikely to go wrong at the same time. But it also gives you leverage over your borrowers. So you know if you're a small borrower, then it's potentially easier for the bank to turn around saying, no, you need to pay us back now. We don't really care. If you're a gigantic borrower, actually, it becomes more of a negotiation. So there's more at stake from both sides. Uh, it's more of an equal party. So scale is one of the things that runs through a lot of these navigators. But then it can get very, very detailed. So things like reserve life and oil and gas. Things that if you were reading any analyst coverage on a sector, you would see and, and, and they would use to differentiate between between businesses, but I'm not going to go for every every single of those 50 navigators. But they are there; they're all available on the website. And if you're really interested in working out how would Fitch think about your business and your uh, and your sector, have a look at those navigators. They uh, they are uh, they're quite comprehensive. So once you've done the qualitative side, we then think about trying to try to sort of come up with an overall risk from the qualitative side. And if you if you're thinking about this in very simple terms, what we're trying to do is work out how stable the revenues are. Or, or how stable the, the cash flows coming in are really. So you know, you think about revenues, think about costs. That generates an amount of cash that you have to play with. You can obviously put some of that in the capex, and some of that will be discretionary. You can start to think about how stable and predictable a position is this. If it's less stable, we'll be looking for you know, higher margins typically, so that when things are going badly, you're not you're not in negative territory. But essentially, assess- assessing how how solid is that cash flow that you'll use to underlie uh, or, or to pay your debt? And what you then do is you say, okay, if, if that is a really stable, steady cash flow for a certain rating, you can take on more debt because uh, usually there will be less variability and there'll be no point at which or there'll be less likelihood of there being a point at which you can't make those debt repayments. If you've got a very volatile business for a particular rating, you will have a lower leverage allowance. So you know, you'll have maybe one times at uh, investment grade if you're very very volatile. So, and we look at this in terms of uh, in terms of cash flows. So much, you know, much as we're trying to look at the the generation of cash on the qualitative side, when we look at uh, look at our leverage metrics, I mean, they're, they're obviously you know, classic sort of business school type leverage would be debt to equity. We find that less useful from a corporate basis because debt to equity, the equity component depends a lot on what choices you've made in the past. If you've grown organically or grown by M&A, you'd have generated 
balance sheet assets of the M&A, which you wouldn't do if you if you grew organically. And therefore, you could end up with a very skewed set of metrics for actually a very similar sort of company. So we tend to look at how much cash you're generating and play that forward to see what your ability to pay down your debt is. So you put the qualitative and the quantitative together and you come up with the overall rating. Two other points to mention. Really. One is I mentioned understanding the business is important to us. The main reason that is, well, obviously the qualitative is, is, is a big part of this, but it also allows us to forecast. So it allows us to push forward with our thoughts on what the credit metrics might be. So what we often see are, are companies in a state of flux. I mean, there, there are very few circumstances we see where a company is completely dead flat with similar credit metrics. You know, this is a real world, particularly the last four or five years. Businesses have have been up and down quite a lot. What we don't do is simply take last year's metrics, say, okay, that's that's not appropriate anymore. We'll we'll mark you up or down. We're aiming for an element of stability to reflect the fundamental of the, of the business. And we do that using our forecasts. Uh, we we I suppose I won't say perfected, but we spent a lot of time working on this during the financial crisis of 2008-9. We trust our forecasts. We spent a lot of time doing them. And we use them to make rating decisions. So yeah, we're not we're not backward looking. We are very, very much forward looking. What does that mean? I mean, a, a good example of that is if we look to the uh, look to the pandemic, we were essentially uh, you know, it was one of those it was, it was a terrifying situation if you're in our position, if you like, because suddenly it's a bit like someone's got a deck of cards and throwing them up in the air. Um, you know, all that you thought you knew was, has just changed. But what we were able to do was say, okay. This is this is judging by what we understand about this and what's happening with lockdowns. You can fairly quickly say, okay, it's the stuff that needs face to face contact that's going to be impacted, and you then think about which of those companies might be more or less impacted based on your initial judgment. And what we did was we we did a sort of triage first of all, rank things in terms of you know, looking at how much risk were they, and also what's their headroom within the rating. And we triaged and we, we brought them to committee. When we were going to committee, what we looked at was uh, firstly liquidity. So this is in early 2020. You know, can we can this company get through to the end of the year? But secondly, what do we think it's going to look like at the end of 2021? So you know, looking really the best part of two years out to whether it could get through and recover to something which looks appropriate for its credit rating in terms of its its credit metric, its, its its leverage, its coverage. What that meant was we didn't downgrade as many companies as as we might have done if we were purely knee jerking. And yeah, you know, we we've had a reasonable amount of praise in the market of that. But also, yeah, you know, while I look at our our performance, we've also not seen a vast number of upgrades from the it was it was over a hundred, but you know, in comparison to some of our, our competitors, that was quite a limited number of downgrades. We haven't seen many upgrades either, which suggests that what we what we did do was the correct call in that when we took things down, they did actually stay down for quite a while. And obviously, you know, the current economic circumstances mean that not that many of them have gone back up again. Lots of nuggets here, Alex. To come back to one of the one of your mentions. So of course we're not gonna get into the 50 naviga- navigators, sorry, but I, I'm a bit interested. As you mentioned, those the visual aids. What is your benchmark then? When you look at an industry, to come back to one of your first points, like what sort of characteristics are associated with any of the ratings, double A, triple B, whatever? What's your it's, benchmark then? How do you determine that? I suppose we look at, so, I mean, it's all slightly circular in that we, we also been doing it for quite a while. So we actually put together these navigators by looking at where the ratings were originally sat and what characteristics we'd seen in our experience making a positive difference. So... You know what? What we have is a a track record going back over twenty years, showing that our ratings effectively work. And we we put these navigators in place something like a decade ago. So we were very much using our our, our experience. But it's it's you know th- these aren't things which are I suppose magical or or or, or not um, not common sense. So scale, you know, is one. Are there barriers to entry? The regulation stable and favorable. You know, do, if you're if you're an oil company again, I'll go back to that example. Do you have a lot of reserves in the ground, or are you about to run out of oil to you know, extract? So, so all of these characteristics they tend to make sense, particularly if you know the industry. 
And what you then have to do is 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 obviously start calibrating those. And the way that we we do that is we say, okay, we, we've got a list of ratings already, and we know that broadly how we've got here works. What do we associate with a you know with a double A company in terms of its, its reserves or single A company in terms of the regulatory environment you've got to have to reach that? You map the characteristics onto a, a sort of an already known or already opinioned quantity. And then you look at it and say, does this make sense? And obviously, we've been working with these for 10 years or so since we, since we did the navigators, and it still seems to be working. So, so you know, there's evidence that it's, all, it's all, uh, all making sense to us. Absolutely. What I, what I love about what you're explaining, Alex, is that so I think most of the people got a bit a taste of what a rating is with the subprime uh, crisis, obviously. Uh, when you get into the corporate world, obviously, you, you see those more and more, but you can easily think that it's mostly a financial statement analysis that is done. Yeah. But what you explain is that that's absolutely not the case. You look at the business. So in terms of, we're going to come to it, but in terms of resources and people that are working with you, they are not only finance analysts, those are also business analysts and people who will be able to say, okay, when you mentioned this, is there enough gro- oil in the ground? Is there like, what are the circumstances and the context in which this industry evolves and so on? That's super interesting. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. I, I tend to think about... Um, you know, all of our all of our people are trained to read and analyze accounts, but I tend to think about that as reading. I mean, you know, it's a bit like uh, going to study and not being able to read the language you're studying. It's kind of the basics. Understanding how a set of financials works, how a bond indenture works, is important. But how, understanding how the business works, and we we get a wonderful variety of things, and that's part of the joy of doing this job is that you see all sorts of different different business models and issuers, and, and a lot of them are. But are really clever. So what we get is a lot of people that have an interest in working out how the world works and how you know how that sausage I saw in the supermarket on a hot day when everybody's barbecuing <laughs> managed to make its way there in such quantities. Uh, yeah, that's that's the sort of thing that's that's fascinating to the people that work. With. That's really really cool. Another point you mentioned was M and A when you were especially touching upon this debt to equity ratio, right? My understanding was that companies that are renowned to go through a phase of merger and acquisitions usually tend to have a lower credit rating because there is a bit of uncertainty associated to it. Why is that? Is my perception correct, first of all? If so, why is that? And back to the growth aspect you mentioned, because M&A enables that, enables growth, maybe less in a steady way, but growth for sure. So how is the M&A aspect impacting the credit rating back to those, how do you actually rate companies? Yeah, so there's, there's, I mean, there's a few things that happen when you get M and A. One is typically, uh, you know, and, and obviously there are there is failed M and A, and there are problems with M and A sometimes. But the business profile or the the operation, so the the um, the operational profile will improve. So you know, we were saying scale diversification is positive. If you do M and A, and yeah, you know, let's assume you're you're not crazy, right? You've, you you've thought about it. You're doing it for a good reason. You'll be strengthening your say your your product portfolio or diversifying into an adjacency and, and you'll be able to realize some synergies from that. So the process of doing MA in terms of getting something else attached to your business is generally positive. You know, there's the question of how much are you paying for it. So if you're if you're paying a large amount of cash for something that maybe doesn't have that many synergies, that's a that's a judgmental point. And we do occasionally see MA that we don't think is brilliant. But for the most part, the people doing it are pretty sensible, and it is positive for the operational profile of the business. If we look then at the financial profile, it gets a bit trickier. So, yeah, obviously there are a few ways to pay for M and A. One is with your own equity, and if that happens, you know that's certainly for the credit rating generally the most favourable because there's no additional debt there. Usually, there's either a mixture of debt and equity, or there is uh, pure debt. And that's where it starts to become a little bit complicated because then it is really a trade-off between how much does the M&A enhance your operational profile versus how much additional debt do you take on? How, do, how much does that increase risk? So you know, we have companies that do, you might call it a you know, single big ticket M&A. You get you know, giant investment grade companies that will buy a, a competitor and that will be hugely strategically important, but it tends to be incredibly expensive. So you might see if you've got a, say, two and a half times leverage threshold for somebody, it'll shoot up to four and might stay there for a couple of years. 
Now that's where the forecasting gets interesting because we then say, okay, we know that this is business enhancing or we think this is business enhancing. Can we wait for the leverage to come down? If we are comfortable enough that you know, over a reason, the additional cash flow is being generated and the commitment of management is such that we can reasonably expect that to come within its tolerance again, the chances are we'll leave the rating where it is. So we, we, we will try not to move if we believe that that is achievable. But obviously, that's a, that's a pretty big judgment call. And we don't always agree with, with management's view on it. They tend to, tend to believe in themselves, and sometimes, unfortunately, we don't. And so when we look at other aspects that the company can influence the credits rating on, how does the role of a corporate treasury department factor into this whole process? I mean, tre treasurers end up usually being the, the people we speak to the most in these processes. It doesn't, doesn't have to be the case, but, but it seems to be just the way of things that treasurers are tasked with, with dealing with capital markets, raising debt, and therefore the credit rating agencies sort of come under them. We have them generally as our, our first point of contact. They'll often pull in people like uh, the investor relations department or potentially the CFO. But for most relationships, it's the treasury team that we are most often speaking to. What does that mean in terms of in terms of the interaction? I mean, the, the, the person in the treasury team is really the conduit for the rest of the organization. Because yeah, as you've heard, we, are, we will be trying to understand uh, not just about finance and, and strategy and stuff the treasurer spends all day thinking about, but also about the company, its merits, its business model. So typically, the treasurer is not going to be able to answer all of that at once. So it's very much about the treasurer bringing in the information that they think we will we will need, or you know, we'll usually give questions. So it's a question answer those questions, but very much being that that sort of conduit to the rest of the organization. Super clear. Um, so if if I'm a treasurer, then Alex, what can I do proactively to be able to improve that credit rating or to put my company in the best position for that? I, I suppose that's the thing. You know, the obvious thing that the treasurer can do is have less debt. Typically, you know that that that, that tends to help. You know, other than other than fundamentals like what is the structure of your balance sheet, how strong is your business, there's not much that's non-real that a that a that a treasurer can do. I mean, what what we look for in sort of treasury functions and funding is a it's the quantum of debt, but also the term structure, the sources of finance. Uh, you know, are you are you just reliant on a, a local banking relationship, or do you have lots of other options? So we'll think about liquidity, and that's obviously the key thing that a treasurer can influence. I mean, hopefully not just for the sake of the credit rating, hopefully that's part of part of their job. But but yeah, you know, when we look across different treasuries, then the structure of the debt is an important part of what we do. And that's very much within the purview of the treasurer. Uh, yeah, other than that, it's really, I suppose it, it, it's, it's a question of just understanding what will facilitate the process and make it easier. And, and I suppose developing you know a bit of trust, the good relationships that we see are ones where we are we are brought inside. We're not surprised. Um, you know, if, if there's a big M and A, often we get told about it a few days in advance. We can think about it. If there's a problem, we get told about it early, and it's managed proactively. So, you know, the, the, the same, it's the same sort of skill that you'd see uh, a CFO using with capital markets. It's it's finding a problem and discussing it with a you know with a relationship of trust with. With, with your rating agency. I mean, the, you know, the worst things that we, th that we find in these relationships, which inevitably, you know, tend not to help, help the treasurer are where there's, there, there are surprises. We feel like that something is being uh, kept away from us. You know, yeah, if I, if I look across all these relationships, developing that relationship of trust is, is really important for us, but it's also where we have the, you know, the best relationships with treasurers. I'm guessing only companies of a certain size need to start having that close of a relationship with you, right? Like your your normal SME is not at what size does the treasurer of a company have to start worrying about keeping you guys in the loop with all of these uh, decisions so proactively? Well, I mean, the, we, we tend not to look at small companies. So essentially, if you're big enough to be rated, then yeah, we'd expect those those discussions to be being had. Yeah, we, we don't differentiate between credit ratings. We don't differentiate yeah, the amount of work we do. The process takes uh, often a similar amount of time. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, yeah, there's many issues with smaller companies as larger companies. So 
yeah, I wouldn't say there was any any difference in those relationships. And and obviously, if you're you know if, if you're a treasurer with fifty billion of debt to raise, you probably take it as seriously as a treasurer with a billion of debt to raise because it's still your company. Uh, yeah, I mean, a, a, a relationship of, of of trust is important uh, on both sides. So, so could could you go back a little bit to the credit scale that you've mentioned a couple of times, Alex? So. You mentioned like triple A, double A, et cetera. I think it goes all the way down to D, right? Can you just yeah. like give us a brief overview and, and how that works? I mean there there are there are a few few credit ratings that uh, that people talk about. Uh, usually the credit rating is what we call the issue of default rating technically. In fact, if we're being really technical, we call it the uh, the long term foreign currency issue of default rating. So when people talk about the rating, that's that's what they're talking about. So what issue of default means Essentially, we're talking about the chances of the company defaulting. So, fairly clear what that means. That, yeah, that, that that's all about likelihood of default. Foreign currency means we're thinking about obligations that can be traded across border. So it's not something where there's potentially transfer and convertibility risks. So that they're usually in currencies like dollars, euros, etc. Now, and, and long term means we're looking across a, a longer horizon than short-term ratings, which are slightly different, which are money market related typically. So this is, yeah, this is a few years out effectively. Within that, what we have is triple A to D scale. So you have it split triple uh, A to triple uh, B minus. And within each, uh, within most of the, the categories, triple you know, A, double A, single A, triple B, you have plus and minus modifiers. So a triple B minus is at the lower end of that band triple B plus is at the top end of that band. There is a, a, a cutoff between triple B minus and everything below it, which is investment grade versus sub-investment grade. The sub-investment grade is you know, traditionally been associated with, with far riskier debt. I mean, you know, in the 1980s, these to be called junk bonds in the, in the US. I mean, now what we've seen really in the last 10, 15 years is that Sub investment grade part of the market. So these are these are companies which are rated in the double B range, single B range, uh, but still performing performing businesses. That part of the market has expanded quite a lot. So you know that kind of that junk sort of prefix that you that you used to have starts to feel a little bit pejorative. Um, yeah, there are a lot of very good companies issuing at that scale. But they're just a little bit smaller than the companies that are at investment grade or have a little bit more leverage. So we see a lot of LBOs, for example, with with ratings in the single B territory as part of a uh, you know, part of a corporate strategy to act as part of, say, a private equity group or, or what have you, but putting debt in there is part of what they're doing. But you know that that is part of a, a thought out strategy, and not necessarily because the business is in a in, in a difficult situation. And then below that, you've got sort of the, the more distressed territory. So B minus and above are essentially performing obligations. Triple C plus, so there's the triple C range, double C and single C, which is, you know, there is a very real default risk present there, uh, as, and more so as you go down the scale. And then there's uh, restricted default and, 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 and default, which is obviously some of all the defaults happening. Uh, the, D, um, the D rating itself is essentially something like a liquidation. That's interesting you touched on. Like, not every company is aiming to always aim for triple A. Absolutely, um, and you know a lot of the so we we work with companies all over the world in developed markets, emerging markets, and there are there are concerns, particularly once you get into emerging markets, around what the rating can get to as a maximum. So you know you, you might be the best the best company in a in, in a certain country, and you think you should be triple A. Well, actually, your country's rating is is single B. So are you really that much better than the government? Well. Essentially, probably not. What we do there sometimes, if there are large, large financial markets, and we see this in some of the emerging markets where you have, uh, say, a, a burgeoning pension market in a in a in a country that's rated maybe double B minus or, or B plus or something, it's not going to be much help to people investing their pension if they know that a whole bunch of stuff is B plus. Everything's B plus in the country, so it's not going to help them differentiate. So what we do is we have essentially sort of the expanded scales that we call national ratings for some of those countries. Uh, and what that's designed to do is to help people decide between the different investments that on an international scale would be uh, a B plus 
but we can start to differentiate within that B plus by assigning something which is, let's say, a double A national or triple A national scale, and that that's a, a full rating scale. It just it just starts if you were to map it to investment grade. It starts with B plus equaling triple A. So you, you get that more granularity, so it can become a bit more helpful. So you like scale it according to country, almost exactly, exactly. And do you then do the exact same business analysis, quantitative and qualitative of the government and the local, of the, of the market as a whole? So you know, I mean, that's not my that's not my not my area. So I'm sure if you get a sovereign analyst on, they can they can give you a separate hour on sovereign ratings. Yeah, but they they look at you know some of the similar things like governance, like financial profile. And they come up with ratings. It's, it's the same scale they use. But Fitch or independent companies like Fitch, you guys issue a sovereign rating, like a government rating, and then business ratings within that. And then you try and yes. like, so we cover most of the, I think, all of the relevant or sort of capital market available sectors. So sovereigns is a big part of that. We cover most of the world's sovereigns. Obviously, we do financial institutions as well, structured finance, public finance. So. Yeah, most most of of what you might see in a in a in a large bond market, uh, Fitch Fitch will do in one one part of the business or other. I look after the, you know, the I suppose the simple non financial corporate. Linking back to this, indeed, so the, the ratings we are we are talking about mostly here. Um, what's the significance of a credit rating for a company in terms of actual impacts? Like, how what's the what is at stake for a company when it comes to the credit rating? The main thing is is the price of the debt. So, obviously, if you're potentially loaning somebody money, then you're not just making a yes no decision. You're making a decision about how much, what's the what's the interest rate you're going to get on that on that debt, and, and to an extent, what terms and conditions are you going to going to demand from the from the borrower. So, if you're trying to work out what the what the credit risk is, then independent opinions like Fitch's are obviously very important. And one of the things that investors use when they're trying to try to come up with that uh, with that pricing that pricing view. So, credit ratings mainly have an impact on pricing, but also you know, there are other ways they use. So you can use them to look at your supply chain, for example. Just look at counterparty risk. That's not what they're designed for, but some people do use them as a proxy. Some people like to use them as as a sort of benchmark for their own internal internal governance. So particularly we see this with groups with private ownership. You know, they don't have the discipline of the capital markets. They need some sort of third third party. So actually getting a independent view on what their credit worthiness is is very valuable to them. Very interesting. Yeah. So also for the private companies, I didn't even think of that. Makes a lot of sense. And so to state a bit the obvious, Alex, um, because now that we have the main reason and the main impact, what are the consequences of an upgrade in credit rating? And Obviously, from an opposite standpoint, about what about the downgrade? Like, what's the impact for a company? It's, it's sort of slightly perverse in the sense that if there's an upgrade, it may well not do anything immediately. Yeah, you know, what it means is the next bond you issue, mm. you may be able to to negotiate better pricing. A downgrade similarly might not do anything immediately because what we're talking about mainly here is fixed income investments. So the the interest rate is fixed at the start of the uh, start of the period, and it's continues until the bond needs to be repaid. It's only when you need to refinance that actually the, the rating has an impact on the borrower. The lenders will potentially be marking the bond to market. So uh, it will have an impact on them and on the markets. Uh, and that will obviously affect their willingness to, to, to lend again in the future. And I think I suppose the, you know, the, the second point of this is a lot of it is not just about of the price, it's also about refinancing. We've seen this in the current market where refinancing is no longer a given. It's more of a question mark uh, about whether companies can get a bond away. If they're, if they're, you know, if they're high risk, if they're not known by the market, there have been windows where it's been very, very hard to, to just get a deal done. Obviously, negative news on the rating side can make that a bit harder. Because I had in mind, obviously, it will cost more money to borrow money. But from a lender standpoint, if you are a public company and you resell the bonds afterwards, it might be trickier for you to resell it, even though you might have had better interest rates on your uh, investment. If the pricing hasn't changed in the interim, so if you're being fairly compensated for the risk, so so it was downgraded, then you 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 bought the bond. It should, yeah. The market should, in theory, all work out. If you bought a bond at five percent and then it gets downgraded, then yeah, the 
the appropriate rate might have been six percent, and therefore you you will you will take a hit to the the fair value potentially. We would like to dive a little bit deeper into the role of ESG in credit ratings. So maybe to begin with, can you explain what ESG factors are and why they have become important in credit ratings? So ESG has been, I suppose, growing up over the last the last decade or so as a as a broadly discussed concept. If I if I you know look back at maybe the history of how Fitch Fitch was thinking about this when when you know we were looking I suppose mid mid last century ESG was being talked about quite a lot, and a lot of the concepts that were being discussed were things that we were already doing. So governance, for example, has always been a massive part of our of our criteria and our thinking, you know, particularly having an impact in, in emerging markets usually, but but sometimes in developed markets as well. Our first thought about this was, well, we're actually doing quite a lot of these these things. How can we make it clear to everybody what we're doing? So, you know, the, the first thing the market was was asking for was you've got your credit ratings. How do you how do you include ESG in that? So our first our first step, and, and and it happened in 2019, was to produce what we call uh, ESG relevance scores. So essentially, what we do is we say, okay, we've just we just concluded on the ratings. The end of the committee. We've got 14 specific ESG factors that we we think about. Did any of these specific factors have a um, a material influence on the rating? And so it's, it's, it's an observation on what we did. It's not new criteria telling us what we should do, but it allows us to sort of step back and think what ESG factors were in here. The way that we score it, we have a one to five. So one is, you know, this factor, it, it's just completely irrelevant for this, for this sector. So, um, you know, I suppose water usage in airlines is an example. Obviously you could find a tiny tangential way, but it's not in any way a major issue. And then it gets to three, which is the middle, which is this issue is potentially important, but also it's under control. It's not having an impact yet. So, so there's a, there's a theoretical issue here, but the issue is controlling it. Then you get up to five, which is okay. An, an ESG factor we've identified specifically changed the rating. So you have that gradation four is, is there's a material impact. So essentially it was, it was part of the rating construction, but not, not something which changed the rating by itself. So we, we've, we've scored on that one to five, one to five basis. That was essentially looking at what we were doing and highlighting what's important. Because, you know, as we discussed, the bulk of what we do is trying to understand the business, understand all the various risks. There's no sort of checklist of, of, of what we're thinking about. It's trying to understand the thing holistically. So if there was a problem with wildfires, you know, that's in the ratings. In fact, some of the fibes that we see in, in the US, for example, at the moment, are just down to wildfire risk. So we should have picked up all those risks anyway. We then, we, you know, we, we, we came along with that for, for, for quite a long time. And if we look at the various ES and G factors where we have an impact, whether it's a four or a five, about a quarter of ratings are impacted by some sort of ESG factor materially. The biggest of those is governance by by quite a long way. So as I said, governance affects emerging markets. It can affect developed markets as well if it's not uh, it's not up to scratch. It tends to be a negative rather than positive. So you know, if governance is fine, that doesn't necessarily raise a rating, but it it can drag a rating down if it's it's not fine. Second, you have social factors which change markets. And then only finally do you get the environmental factors. So about 6% of our ratings now have an elevated environmental factor, which when you're sitting there thinking about climate change and climate policies, feels incredibly low. What we therefore tried to do was think more about climate because climate is a, is a weird a weird thing to get your head around in terms of, in, in terms of credit ratings. Because we tend to think about we don't have a fixed rating horizon. So in theory, our horizon is is infinite. Practically, though, we do tend to focus a lot more attention on things that are better understood, more certain, which means shorter term. So our forecasts are three to five years, for example. Things that are going to occur in that period have a lot more weight than things that are going to be you know, 15 years out, for example, which is where climate's a problem because a lot of these changes don't tend to have an impact on the companies we're looking at in any material way in a, a, a short period of, uh, of time in that sort of three to five year period. So 
we wanted to think about doing two things really. One was making sure we were capturing all the risks, and the other was giving investors a signal of what's out there in the longer term. So even if something isn't included in the credit rating, let them know that it's out there so they can start making their own judgments as to whether they think in their analysis it should be. Because you know, credit is only one part of a, a, a pricing decision. There's also market aspects, which could potentially cause pricing to move before credit becomes a real issue. There we've, we've come up with our, our uh, climate vulnerability signals, which started off a few years ago as a series of reports looking at sectors. We've now started doing them for, uh, for companies earlier this year. So we're probably about halfway through scoring up the portfolio as we, as we speak. Uh, and that's a scale of zero to 100, where the middle of that scale, so 50, will tell you you're expecting, or, or if, if the company doesn't do anything to mitigate the, the risk, you could have a maybe a one notch downgrade, roughly, of that company by the year that, that the score is set. So each of these is not just a point in time score; it's a curve. So it shows that build up. So if you're an investor and you're concerned about what's happening to your risk twenty five years out, you can look at the end of the curve and see that. If you're looking, you know, if you're concerned only about five years out, you can see that too. The signal will tell you what the potential risk to the, to the rating is at that at that point along the curve. So it's mainly focusing on the actual risk. Is there any notion of saying, especially with how the, the world is evolving lately, around saying more, okay, this company really doesn't do any effort on whatever it is, E, S, or G. Therefore, they should be a bit penalized when you look at the cost of debt, basically? Or is, it no, is there no such a, such a notion here? This was, this was a big, um, and still is a big point of debate in the market. You know, what should credit raters, others do, and what should they include in their, uh, in their methodologies? Our view has been, yeah, we, we do credit. We understand credit. So the, the vulnerability signal only looks at the potential credit impact of, uh, of, of these events. Obviously, you can do an awful lot more if you start thinking about the broader impacts, and then typically it's referred to as impact. All the other uh, work that it's done around ESG as to whether the company's doing good, its impact on society, the economy, on people. But we need to be, or we are quite clear as to where you know, our role as a rating agency sits, which is, which is purely we're looking at credit. Now, we do have another part of the business called Sustainable Fitch, which specifically looks at those broader factors of impact. Uh, we have our, our clear lines, but as a, as, a, as a company, we are thinking more broadly about this. And as I say, some of those things can be important because they could potentially at some point start influencing pricing and things in a different way. Uh, but we are, we are focusing on, uh, on credit. So let's put you on the spot a little bit. So I'm looking at the vulnerability score right now, or the signals across industries. Signals, thank you. Yep. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> um, so interestingly, it says that wind and solar and electricity networks are going to be unaffected over the next well, 20, 30 years. I would assume that the vulnerability of those industries would be steady. That makes sense, meaning that they're not going to change in investment risk over time. Is that, is that what it's trying to say? Because I see things like oil production going up in terms of vulnerability. I see things like uh, petrochemicals going up, although albeit slower. Yeah. Um, so the way to read it is over time, things like oil production, petrochemicals, coal generation are going to get more are more likely to be vulnerable as to climate change over time. Whereas electricity networks and solar are you're saying aren't going to be affected at all. Would they not get better as investment opportunities? Essentially, so so we are, you know, we're all about risk. So we're trying to measure the uh, the downside risk. So we're not, you know, we're not going sort of negative and, and measuring potential upside. What we've defined ten as is, you know, there is potentially, essentially, that there there is no negative impact from the from the climate transition, and in fact, there might be a positive impact there. We're not trying to, you know, we haven't gone the other side and try and quantify the positive. Obviously, if you're doing solar and renewables. Then you are getting probably a tailwind from um, uh, from the transition, uh, but yeah, that, that's I mean the, the way to look at it. So we're not so concerned if if, it, if it's good. I mean the you know the reality is that 
if you look at renewables and other sectors, they have their own problems. So, yeah, this isn't saying if you look at sectors, they're riskless. It's just saying that if you think about climate transition's impact on them, it's 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 neutral or positive at those kind of levels. And albeit something something like networks are quite interesting because we're not saying they're not going to be impacted. So, you know, I I, I took the plunge a couple of months ago and put put panels on my roof. Now you, you can imagine the the complication of of an electricity network where you used to just pump electricity one way. To moving to one where you've got to actually suddenly account for all of these random little bits of generation all over the place, contributing to the overall flow of electricity, and some of it comes on, some of it is not. You know, some of it depends whether I choose to plug in my electric car or not. There's a lot of investment required, but, but typically these sort of companies get remunerated based on their investment. So, so they should be they should be in a, in a reasonably good position if they're forced to expand, but. You know, no bones about it. There's going to have to be a lot of work done by the networks to keep things functioning in the new environment. Yeah, because you're not just factoring the risk of companies; those companies being affected. You're also factoring the risk of the government being able to keep up with micro generation house to house. Right. E- exactly. Exactly. I mean, what you know, what's interesting is is you you picked what I'd probably call the obvious examples in there, which is um, yeah, the renewables on one side, coal on the other. I mean, what's what's interesting where we think we provide real value is the bit in the middle, you know, which is things like cement. So if if we step back a bit, it's it's really hard to try and do this sort of analysis because one of the first things you you run up against is no one actually knows what's going to happen. No, no one knows what's going to happen sort of two years out, let alone fifteen, twenty five years out. So we get around that by just assuming a particular scenario and using that as our as our benchmark. We've taken the UNPRI's inevitable policy response, which is um, it's it's designed for investors. It's really granular. Has a lot of a lot of things going for it. It's a one point eight degree scenario, which provides enough of a challenge that it gives us something to get our teeth into when we're looking at how well sectors uh, how well sectors have to have to change to cope. So we take that scenario, but the important point is we give it to our analysts. So these are you remember people who focus all their attention thinking about looking at sectors all the time. So we give them that analysis and all that scenario and say, okay, what's the risk to your sector under this scenario? And that's a question that they can essentially answer because you know, we usually give them a macro scenario and say, okay, if this is going to happen, what, what happens to your sector? Uh, so they can do that with a broader climate base assumption. And it generates the obvious stuff, as we said, the, you know, Renewables do quite well. Um, coal-fired power stations don't do so well. But somewhere in the middle, you've got the things like cement. And cement's really interesting because cement generates about 8 or 9% of the world's CO2 emissions, right? It's hugely, hugely greenhouse gas generating. But if you think about a scenario where you have potentially you know, more extreme weather, uh, you need to build out electricity grids, as we were just talking about. You need to uh, invest in loads and loads of different infrastructure. Then you're going to need an awful lot of cement to do that. Actually, the price elasticity of demand for cement is very, very inelastic, which means that if they've got to pay for their carbon, if they've got to invest in experimental new processes, they'll be able to pass a lot of those costs on to the end customer. So cement ends up actually somewhere in the middle. So they're going to have to do an awful lot of work, but there's no fundamental threat to the cement industry that we can see. Yeah, you've also got some other interesting industries on there like uh, gaming and gambling and stuff like this, which I couldn't access because I need to make an account, which maybe I'll do later. But people can go on the website and we'll put the link in below. Bringing it back to treasury and traders, Alex, if I'm a treasurer sitting in one of these companies that perhaps has a high vulnerability signal, can I get the wording right, not score signal? Uh, yes. <laughs> How would I react differently as a treasurer to try and uh, improve or to, to try and work towards putting my company in the best position? So how should a treasurer take it? Okay, if I'm a treasurer sitting in a, let's say, a petrochemical company versus sitting in a wind turbine manufacturing company, how, how do I how do I react to these differently? A lot depends on how integrated the treasury function is in, in the rest of the architecture around ESG. So... We see, I mean, when I speak to fixed income investors, we see loads of different organizations um, 
and ways of thinking about ESG within them. Within companies, I'm sure it's, it's even more diverse how they consider it. But if you've got a head of um, sustainability, then you know I, I would expect a treasurer to be fully on board with what was what was being discussed, what the plan is. Yeah, you know, be able to to, to think about uh, that in the broader context of financing, explain it. Because I think everybody nowadays that's that's being talked to, or that's 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 involved with external parties, they'll be being asked about ESG. It would seem obvious that everybody should be able to um, to discuss it, particularly if you've got those external facing roles. Yeah, you know, I think I think the point at which anybody in an organisation can think that ESG is sort of somebody else's problem is uh, it's, it is a long past. And obviously, you know, the sort of questions we will be asking are, okay, you're your transition to green steel, and you say you're going to do that by 2030, how much is it going to cost? So make sure that information is surfaced uh, in a way that, that that external parties can potentially understand. So you know, it just comes down to that point that yeah, the, the better treasurers we work with and be- the better teams we work with are transparent. It, it seems to be a formula that is uh, more effective in communicating than, than, than not. This typically when we talk ESG in total, and we've talked a couple of times previously on the podcast, the G, and you mentioned it before earlier, earlier as well, the G is really where companies internally can have the biggest influence on, is their internal governance um, as well. A little bit on sustainability, like making some changes internally that will help them be more sustainability conscious as, as in terms of their impact. So if you just talk very quickly as well about the G side of things, how can treasurers do that will typically give them a better rating in terms of their governance. Because for the people to understand how treasurers play a role there. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, so, so the companies that we look at where we assess governance, the governance tends to be beyond the treasury to an extent. So, so, so you know, what we see is there's a, th- th- there tends to be sort of an overarching governance. The treasury is usually part of that. You know, your, your, your listeners will know all the good things you're meant to do as a, as a treasury manager in terms of where you can park your money safely, having strong policies. And frankly, you know more about it than I do. So a company that generally has good governance will generally have that, that sort of discipline in place and that sort of professionalism in place. We rarely sort of downgrade or take a view based purely on what a treasury function is doing because it tends to be more, perspe- more pervasive. If, if the rest of the governance is is weaker, then usually that's reflected in a in a less professional treasury. They tend to come together. So, you know, specifically, I suppose the treasurer's role in this is is essentially making sure that uh, they can a discuss their policies, have clear policies in place, they follow them, uh, but also can talk more generally about governance in the organisation. Again, again, it's that it's that role of a of a, of a funnel of making sure that the information flows to the rating agency relationships again that uh, seems to yeah. be the key factor here for you as the rating agency alex how difficult what are the challenges of incorporating esg into your rating overall so we touched on like the long-term typical long-term impact of it versus you know that's not very controllable and why you want probably to be looking three to five years out where climate change is probably longer term than that what other difficulties do you have incorporating esg into your credit rating scores it really is that it's that time horizon question, and the 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 way that we've we've thought about that, and we have thought an awful lot about it, is to use the the vulnerability signal as a a means of telling us, okay, in fifteen years there might be a problem. Do we have to? You know, what's the nature of that problem? Do we see that raising its head already? So, you know, for us, it's about trying to understand well in advance what some of these long term trends are. And reflect them at the, the earliest possible moment, albeit that may well be not yet. So, in a lot of industries like oil, we're not seeing an impact yet on our credit ratings uh, from climate change, uh, albeit it's something that we're actually talking about quite a lot in our in our committees now. Yeah, it, it's 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 allowing us to make a conscious decision. I think I think the, yeah, the biggest problem is simply ignorance. It's it's if you miss something because you know we've got the Paris Ratchet coming up, uh, which is a, a process that was put in place during the original Paris Agreement where they, uh, the governments agreed that they would start assessing about now whether they had the right policies in place to meet the Paris, Paris goals. If they don't, then in 2025, which is the date of the ratchet, they will ratchet up their policies 
to make sure they meet it. Now, obviously, politics is politics, and you know, don't want to get into into what's currently going on with with, with COP processes, etc. But that's the that's the broad timetable that, that's still been still sort of in force and has, has been laid out. So, if that all works as planned, you would expect to see a pretty rapid acceleration of policies in the second half of this decade. Um, so, the sort of traditional you know, wait and see what those policies might be approach isn't really going to cut it because they're going to be coming very, very quickly and you need to have thought about them in advance. So yeah, avoiding ignorance, really thinking about it and making sure you've got the visibility on when those risks are starting to pull forward from the future into something we need to think about today. Those are the real challenges. Alex, thank you so much for the insights shared so far. Um, we'd like to get a little bit deeper into the current market climates on credit ratings. So how do factors such as interest rates and inflation impact credit ratings to really look at something recent and topical? And this is this has been the question, not just of this year, but of last year as well. So I've been at this 18 years and essentially throughout that time, it's been a story of rates falling. You know, inflation hasn't even been on the radar. And suddenly we're in this, this position where you have economic challenges, but Central banks can't counter them by dropping rates because you've got inflation, which they need to fight. So, if, if we think about it in terms of credit ratings, what are what what are the issues? So, there's I suppose the market issues, and we'll deal with those quickly because what this has done is 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 throw markets into, into a bit of a tailspin. You know, the market is trying to work out in a rising rate environment how they price things. Uh, you know, if you're if you're thinking about a fixed income security. You don't want to say, I'll, I'll, I'll do this at 5% if three months later the market's moved to 6 or 7%. So, so calling the top of the rate cycle is one of the big things the market's focused on. Uh, whether we're there or not, uh, yeah, that's, that's not something that I'm uh, qualified to uh, really opine on, but the market calling the top of that is very important to, to access. So if, you know, what, what, what it means is if you're a strong borrower they like, They'll charge you more. They'll charge you a you know even bigger premium. If you're a borrower they don't know and don't like, they might not lend to you at all. So that's having a real impact lower down the credit rating spectrum, where companies typically have an awful lot more debt, uh, but also they tend to borrow floating rate rather than fixed rate. So most of what we look at, uh, high yield bonds or investment grade bonds, is fixed rate. So actually, changes in interest rates don't immediately have that big an impact. But if you are sitting on six or seven times leverage and you're floating rate, when base rates change, that does have a real impact immediately, and and can get uh, can get quite uh, quite tricky on the operational side. I mean, it's, it's been a real uh, a real roller coaster. So, you know, we mentioned uh, mentioned COVID in the last episode and our our views on that. Uh, I mean, essentially, if if I look at our ratings, we've never recovered from the, the COVID downgrades. So we'd have expected uh, in a normal environment to see further upgrades. E essentially, we haven't. But what we have seen is, is differentiation. So the big companies with less exposure to the consumer, with market power so they can push through input prices to their sales, those companies are doing well. So you know, they're managing to generate cash. They're paying down debt. They know that they need to be fairly cautious in terms of their balance sheet. So actually, they're, they're improving their credit profiles and moving up the rating scale. At the other side, though, we've got those consumer-facing companies where you know we all know consumers are now having to be very, very careful with their money, choosing whether they want to pay their electricity bill or buy that fashionable jacket. That is making that ability to pass on costs, which are rising for pretty much everybody, more questionable for people that are facing the consumer. So that's pretty um yeah, pretty tricky. And obviously the, the 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 real the real problem area that we've got if you if you take the two things that I've talked about, there are some companies in those sectors that also have the seven times leverage um, and maturities coming due. So, you know, one positive is that if we look at maturities, generally speaking, 2021 was a year of absolutely massive issuance. So huge parts of the leverage loan space, which is that single B range typically, managed to refinance in 2021. So the maturity profile is very much back-ended. There were a small number of companies that didn't manage to refinance. 
And those are typically the ones that were still really being hit by COVID, which are typically those retail, those consumer focused companies. And they're now trying to refinance in an environment where the markets are sporadically open. And frankly, it's, for some of them, it's just not happening. You know, and, and their business models are also under threat, so it's still not happening. So it's very tough for, for, for some companies in their sectors. But the story really is differentiation. Some companies doing absolutely fine, and some, particularly with high debt, getting in a bit more difficulty. Tell us a little bit more about how you guys adapted ratings during that time, Alex. So you, you gave us a story earlier about how you... Uh, had to look at all the industries from scratch again with the with the new framework that the economy was under, like with lockdowns, face to face versus things that go online, etc. What other changes did you have to make at the time? And you say because we haven't recovered yet, a lot of the lockdowns yep. have opened again. Like uh, although perhaps not consumer habits, perhaps haven't gone all the way back. But for a good in- example of that might be like the travel industry. So. You can't find a cheap flight anymore because it's just every every flight's overbooked, which was zero during pandemic time. So I assume that some industry have bounced back better than others. So how do you guys keep up to date with all this volatility and things changing so quickly? Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's slightly weird in the sense that the last 18 months don't feel like they've been very volatile, or well, at least the last, last year or so, because it feels like we've been anticipating this whole sort of quasi-stagflation episode. For quite a long time and in some ways it's simply not going away uh you know what, what we had last year which was which was a i suppose a shorter term concern was the russian gas situation so we were very very concerned as was obviously most of europe uh, about what would happen if russian gas was turned off russia obviously supplies a uh, disproportionate amount of gas to large parts of europe i mean what we found was if you looked at the very, very early assumptions, they were pretty, pretty apocalyptic. You know, ten percent of German GDP, that kind of that kind of number, and ten percent for a macroeconomist is just is it's insane. I mean, it's, it's not a number they talk. It's usually talking sort of half percentage points, maybe, and that's really quite bad. So, ten percent is just um, out of this out of this world. We spent a lot of time thinking about okay, where's the various uh, where are the gas pipelines? Where can you get additional gas from? You know, what policies are being put in place, who's being prioritized. And we were looking at that all the way through. And, and we spoke to a lot of corporate treasurers after we'd done our initial homework. So we spoke to a lot of companies understanding what they were doing. And this is where you know there's, there's a selection bias because we rate the biggest, strongest companies in the world. Now, those are the companies that issue bonds. They've usually got plans. They've got flexibility. So they were generally able to give us a pretty good idea of what they had in store. We could model that. And then we took we took some rating actions, but they were fairly limited. I suppose it wasn't a fundamental change to the rating approach. I mean, in fact, it was very similar to the approach we took during COVID, which was, uh, you know, we we just need to get under this problem, understand it, and take actions as appropriate. But you now and again, you get these things which do very much change the game. I think if we look back at the stagflation question, it's not a fundamental change to to what we're looking at. I mean, you know, we're looking at price rises, we're looking at cost rises, we're looking at the cost of borrowing. So that doesn't doesn't change the game for us in that sense. It's it's very much the normal things we deal with. A pandemic or a sudden gas shock, you know, those those are the more sort of difficult one off events that we have to deal with. But we we deal with them by analyzing them. How do you take into account or how do you see the recent events around the failure of several American banks impacting the credit rating process, if any? But we might tend to think that we see that has a systemic impact. How yeah. do you take all this into account and what's the effect you've seen so far? Obviously, I do corporate ratings, so I can't speak for financial institutions. So this is going to be very much from a what did it do to the corporate's kind of angle. Uh, and the, the short answer really was from a European corporate angle, it just extended that period of uncertainty a bit longer. So, you know... We were trying to, or markets were trying to work out where this peak in rates was, where they could go back to business as usual. And they kept getting, you know, they kept getting hits. I mean, the Russian gas thing was, was, was a hit, which they didn't quite know what to deal with. It stopped them going back to normal. The, the, the US bank thing was also a hit. I mean, it's, it seems like it's been it's sort of calmed down a little bit. I mean, I, you know, touch wood, don't know, we're monitoring it. 
um, but it, it seems like it's been uh, it's been contained. Uh, and those banks that were involved in it were quite idiosyncratic. But as I say, we, we are looking at it. If you look at the the spreads between financial and non-financial borrowings, there there is still a there is still a little bit of a, a difference. It's not massive, but it's still there. But I think essentially the corporate market's got over that and is now just sort of moving on and and, and moving ahead a, a bit more. It's normal. Still trying to work out when those rates are going to peak. We're not quite there yet. I don't think with any any kind of certainty. But uh, I think that was has been digested quite nicely in terms of individual corporate analysis. I mean, the banks that we looked at in the US were fairly small. The biggest concern was that it gave rise to some sort of general reduction in in willingness to lend, which is again why having you know, the bigger companies as part of our portfolio is really helpful because they tend to be the safety. Right, you talk about flight to safety when there's a problem. Actually, the things we rate tend to be where people fly to when there's a problem. So, so the risk that they would not be able to borrow is probably lower than than potentially for some smaller company. So, there's more of a risk to the broader broader economy SMEs than there is to you know the the giants that we usually look at. It's less of an immediate threat than you might think. I think that makes sense in the context of the niche banks like Silicon Valley Bank in the US and some of the other small ones there, but. Something like Credit Suisse failing in Europe seems to have a different tone to it, no? In terms of like risk to corporates, if if a bank like Credit Suisse can fail, like we, when we were speaking to treasurers around the time and even now, yeah, um, everyone's in a panic. They don't know where to park their money. It's a very good point. I suppose the you know Credit Suisse was documented as having quite a lot of issues quite a long time. So yes, there's a there's a, a potential disruption there and i'm sure you know there was there was a there was a couple of days when it was a real problem uh but the regulators have arranged a uh, arranged to get out uh you know there are there are certain things in that 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 again i'm not not uh, a bank analyst and not the person to speak to this but there were certain complexities in that which you know which which you can talk about around 81s and that kind of thing but in terms of did it have any impact on corporate ratings that that i'm aware of i don't think it did interesting alex Thank you so much for being on the show. Um, just to wrap up for, for for the episodes, is there anything else you'd like to add on the topics that we've discussed today that we didn't cover? Uh, nothing nothing much to add other than you can find out a lot more on all of this stuff on our websites. FitchRatings.com is, uh, is fairly obvious. If you Google Fitch and climate, you can talk about climate vulnerability signals. And if you're interested, do just uh, you know get in touch with us. There are plenty of contacts on the website. Uh, people can give you a chapter on verse and uh, on how it, how a rating process works and how you get involved. Super cool. And we'll put all the links to Alex's LinkedIn, to the climate vulnerability uh, signals Signal. and and the, yeah, and the pitch website in the show notes below as well. Alex, it was a pleasure to have you on. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.